The Worldwide Church of God presents You're Included, The Good News of Jesus Christ. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Dr. C. Baxter Kruger is with us again, and he is president of Perichoresis, an international nonprofit ministry and author of The Great Dance, The Christian Vision Revisited. With him is his senior assistant, Steve Horn, and uh, let's have our panel introduce themselves. I'm John McKenna. I'm doctrinal advisor to the Worldwide Church of God. I'm Mike Morrison, editor of Together Newsletter. I'm Joseph Tkach. I'm the current president of the Worldwide Church of God. I'm Steve Horn. I'm uh, Dr. Kruger's senior assistant. I'm Baxter Kruger, director of Perry Thank you, everyone. One question that comes up in the discussions we've had, and thanks for being with us again. This is the third time we've been able to meet together in this <laughs> format, and uh, we're delighted to be able to have you again. We've never covered... Perichoresis as a word, and what does it mean, and why is your ministry named perichoresis? Well, we just wanted to figure out what would be the hardest thing to actually pull off in the universe is a <laughs> ministry with a name like that. No. Oh, goodness. Um, the word means technically mutual indwelling. Uh, what attracted to me, me to it early on was the way in which the early church was grappling to explain how the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit works and how can there be three in one? And, and for me to come to see Jesus as the Father, Son, as the Anointed One, and the One in and through and by and for whom all things were created, and to see that, that to speak the name of Jesus Christ is to say Trinity and humanity and creation are not separated but bound together in relationship. And I started thinking, Steve and I were talking about this. We were excited about this. And like, what? How do we talk about this person, Jesus, in this way? And and then we talked about the idea of starting a nonprofit ministry that was essentially Christologically focused, helping people recover the early church's vision. And uh, we were talking about, how do you summarize this in one word? We talked about Emmanuel. We talked about union, both of which are great words that summarize what we're talking about, but those are words that are used all the time. And I said, my favorite theological term forever is perichoresis. I mean, it just it's right at that. It's saying it all in word and word. It says union without loss of personal distinction. It says father, son, spirit relationship, oneness. But not enmeshment. So it's just a classic word, and um, I was naive enough and to think that you know a word like that would not be a marketing problem. Actually, the interesting thing about it is, it's not a marketing problem with the younger generation. They love stuff like that. You know, they just love words like that. So that we've backed into it there. But the other thing I think is interesting about the word is, is as we march historically. Um, the old divisions between science and religion, or at least some of those parts of the division, are beginning to uh, not fall, fall away, but we're having conversation. And it seems to me that there's a lot of scientists out there who are trying to come to some concept of how things can be united and yet remain what they are without being, we would say, psychologically enmeshed or absorbed. And I think that word and the concept of perichoresis is going to be very much at the forefront of as we move into the third Christian millennium in terms of a larger discussion. In the description of the ministry of, of Perry Caracas, you have written that you have established critical dialogue with scientists, with doctors, lawyers, counselors, and teachers, and provided a relational theological vision for a new integration, overcoming the inherited divisions between those uh, disciplines. Yes, I mean, that's, again, a Christological affirmation. I mean, once you see that Jesus is not just, you know, one individual in a uh, a sea of individuals that are unrelated, but he's actually the one in and through and by and for whom all things were created and are sustained, then in him, in, in the person of Jesus, you're talking about the point of unity. You're talking about the, the, um, the one who holds it together. And so that gives us a whole new vantage point for international politics. It gives us a new vantage point for for law and justice and what are we trying to do and who are the people that we're involved with. And so instead of recognizing people according to the flesh, like Paul says, you know, don't recognize people according to, he doesn't recognize people according to the flesh anymore. He saw that one died for all, therefore all died. And so all our divisions and all the ways that we recognize and honor one another's out, there's only people bound up in Christ and their giftedness in that. That's the way we look at people. Then that revolutionizes the way we go about our relations. It gives us a framework to know that I'm not ever going to meet a person on the planet, including a Calvinist, who's not included 
and is not a joint heir with me and a participant in the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit, to know that that's who I'm dealing with radically changes the way that I pray, or it theoretically radically changes. I mean, we, we still fall to our own prejudices and things, but it gives us a foundation for a new dialogue. And then when you talk about that in terms of, of um, economic theory, for example, I mean, where did our current American economic theory come from? It, it came from some philosophy, some some guy or group of guys' way of thinking about the nature of economics. Well, thinking now in Christ that we're bound together in this relationship and we have responsibility uh, to live in the in the unity of our relationship together, that changes some of the dynamics and of uh, what pushes our economy what and the way we value different things. These are all implications. And so what I find is that the more I proclaim uh, this Jesus, the more I've got economists or physicists or scientists or psychologists in the audience who when they see something of the implications for their field immediately want to have a dialogue. And that's that's what's beginning to happen. Physicists and paleontologists, we we tend to, as Christians, limit our dialogue to creation versus evolution. And it's a stark kind of dialogue that draws lines in the sand, God against the uh, evolutionists and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. But mm-hmm. what you're talking about supersedes and transcends that kind of thinking. It's like a shift in paradigm. It's like the old Augustinian Pelagius battle. I mean, you know, you're either Augustinian or you're going to go with the Pelagian framework. But both of those are operating out of the same framework. They're both operating out of an, a failed understanding of objective union, that Jesus has established a relationship with us, that he did that prior to our vote. Well, the, the whole discussion's now got to be changed. And in the same way, when when you see in Jesus Christ that he's the one that's established a relationship with us and with the whole cosmos, and it's integrated in his own being, in his own person, and his relation with the Father and Spirit, now we've got a new paradigm for a way in which we can begin to think differently about some of these things and, and not necessarily assume division, but begin to think, well, let's explore this. Let's think through, for example, I mean, Boetius, um, shortly after Augustine's time, came forward with a definition of person. And he said, a person is an individual substance of a rational nature. And ever since then, that's been the reigning concept of person in the Western world. Our educational system is established on that by an individual substance of a rational order, rational nature. Well, let's redefine person in the light of Christ. A person is one who exists in union with Christ and therefore in communion with the Father and Spirit, in communion with one another, and in communion with creation. So you can be an individual and not a person, because a person is when you are participating in in a relationship in which you exist. So, I mean, you've got a very different concept. Now, what it means for me to be a person involves my relationship in Christ with the whole cosmos, with the environment, with the water, with ecology, with everything, and not just in my backyard, so to speak, but on a global and cosmic level. I mean, just that one little thing changes radically some of the implications for the way we think about lots of things. That's where we are right now in recovering the gospel of the ancient church. It's like, okay, now we've got a lot of work to do. Now we've got to rethink tons of things, and, and that's where we need help. And we're, thank goodness, I mean, we're a long way from being the only people on the planet who are wrestling with this. This is going on all over the place. Perichoresis was also a term, of course, used by the early church to describe and to talk about the Trinity. And then when you start to see that, and the way... I used to teach this, I guess, was more of, in which I did this, mind you, at um, at a place called Harbor House with uh, crack addicts and drug addicts. <laughs> but we would talk about uh, the mutual indwelling, that Father and Son and Holy Spirit mutually indwell each other to the degree that they function as one in relationship because we were trying to move away from a legal framework into one that was showed them a loving father rather than a condemning father. Judge. Mm. Historically, perichoresis, the, the word has been used for relationships within the Trinity, but from what I hear you saying, it's like we are also invited into this relationship too. Are we participating in the and perichoresis? Fu- and function perichoretically when we do it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's almost like the butterfly effect. Mm. It is the <laughs> Trinitarian way of being, and we belong to that way of being, and we're not going to function properly or be happy or prosperous when we're living in a way that is alien to that way of being. And so it's a, it's a fundamental word because it helps us to understand in marriage how you can be 
one and yet not lose yourself in that codependent enmeshment. You, boundaries are established that are real, but you've got oneness. Separate and distinct. So we've been, a, but yet one. We've been invited to the party. Well, it's even stronger than invited to the party. We're being told we're, we're at the party. Ah. Uh-huh. We're so, included in the party. So we can either have fun or we can choose not to. Or we can stay, we can fight to you stay outside and watch from this. Can certainly choose to participate or not to participate. Yeah. You're not going to escape the consequences of either side. But yeah. there's no other way of existing or being apart from this perichoretic relationship that God in himself has created through Father, Son, and Spirit, and in which all the cosmos exists, including us. Absolutely. No other way of being. Amen. Question is, it's, it's and almost we, like, move, we, we move, we breathe, and we have our being. It's almost mm-hmm. like you would say, okay, is it thinkable that this God who exists in this way as Father, Son, and Spirit in this perichoretic relation in which there's oneness but no loss of personal identity, now, is it conceivable that this God would think up another way of being and wire the, the universe mm-hmm. in that way? Mm-hmm. And so I, what we have revealed in Christ is, you know, this is who we are. This is who God is. This is the way the cosmos is wired. And that's why Jesus did miracles. I mean, because it's made for him. It's built after the blueprints or the pattern of his own relationship with the Father and the Spirit. And so when he spoke, it was made to respond to him in that way. Everything that exists then comes out of, as a product of, God's love. And relation, relational love is the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's been called into being and sustained in and out of that, and it has its stamp on it. And, and if we're there, going to understand how beautiful. it works, if we're going to, and this is, this is where I think the, the theory comes forward, if we're going to understand the nature of things or how they work, then here's the blueprint. We're looking at the Father, Son, and Spirit relationship. We want to understand who we are and what we're made for. In what existence we have, here it is. This is the nature of the relationship. It's other-centered, self-sacrificial, love, mutual delight, self-giving for the benefit of the That's the way things are made, and they function like that. But how do we think of ourselves? We don't think of ourselves that way. Typically, at our heart level, we think of ourselves in negative terms. Individual substances failures. that are totally depraved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we see ourselves as ugly, <laughs> worthless on the outside. Unlovable. And independent. And independent, functioning mm-hmm. on our own, oh, and we yeah. have we have life within ourselves, and and by golly, we can produce that. Mm-hmm. What do I need with God? Or at least what, we what? can struggle to produce it. Well, in our fallen minds, we actually think we yeah. can. Yeah. Well, we it's can. only through the quickening of the Holy Spirit that we get convicted to conversion, to have a renewing of the mind, to see that we never brought anything to the party in the first place. But there's a healing in that. Well, certainly there is. In fact, an it is all about healing. It's where yeah. you meet whole new. There's an aspect to this that I think that we should pay some attention to. The perichoretic relationship between the divine and human natures of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is one kind of perichoresis. Mm. The perichoresis of the divine and human nature in the, in the person of Christ is not the same as the perichoresis between the Father, Son, and Spirit in the Trinity. That's correct. And yeah. that's why it was There's basically a, the former was dropped. And as the Trinitarian view of perichoresis emerged historically, the other Christological kind of moved to the to the background. But because of our fallen. I believe I mind. believe that we have to learn to integrate them and distinguish them. That there is a perichoretic relationship between the perichoresis in the incarnation and the perichoresis of the Trinity. And I believe this is important for the relationship to physics, to science. Because the divine and human natures, the divine nature of the Word of God is spaceless and timeless. When the Word of God becomes flesh, what has been living eternally, and I like to use the whatever space and time are a reflection of in eternity, so that I can say uncreated space-time. Uh, has made room and time for itself in the incarnation. So now in this one person, which is why you cannot use Boethian terms, in this one person you have space-time having been created by God for God as a man in relationship with the uncreated space and the uncreated time that God is as triune. 
that's exactly another dimension of the word, the meaning of the word pericles, is make room yes. for hmm. another within your own yes. space time. Now, hmm. now you, history is. you have inherent in this uh, perichoresis the way that transcendence and empiricism belong to one another. Yeah. Well, there's you got to hold of something. Something's got to hold you right there. I cannot quite get it, but I I smell it. <laughs> well, tell you what, let's bring it to a level that maybe people can uh, can grapple with by asking a really difficult question. If we are partakers of the divine nature, and I believe we are, and if all the world, all the people, um, whether they're witting or unwitting of their participation, how do you explain in human history? events like the Holocaust? Well, I mean, I don't want to give a something of, of that enormous proportion and pain and suffering needs a, a deep and detailed answer, but there are basic things to be said. How do you explain the failure of the church? I mean, hmm. um, to me, the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit is not a computer life. Jesus is not programmed to love his father, his three persons in relationship, and that that life is one that involves, to speak uh, anthropomorphically, it involves the mind, heart, and will of each of the three persons, and it involves the choice. And so the life of God does not exist as a pre-programmed thing. It exists as a relationship that's real, where each person is real to the other person. And so if the goal is adoption, if the goal is to create something that is not and then bring that to participate in this Trinitarian life, then one of the things that has to be built into it is our own distinct mind, heart, and will. Because otherwise we're just computers with Christological software. We're robots, and that's not the point. Uh, so that will is, and that choice is there. We're included in this relationship now to participate in it. We must choose to do so on an ongoing relational basis. Now that is the crack to me in the door that allows in the snake. Because we can, in our own distinct mind, hearts, and will, although we're united with the Father, Son, and Spirit, and share in that life, we can, in our own distinction, become very confused and very dark. And in our darkness and confusion, act out, live out of that, and do harm to ourselves and to one another, individually and corporately, and to the cosmos. So the Holocaust is an extreme example of that. Uh, but any form of murder, any form of of um, where we're acting out of our confusion and darkness, which ultimately is not us, doesn't belong to, the, to us as God's creature. It comes from the evil one. That's another discussion. But then the other thing I want to put over the top of that is, um, and again, in no way taking away from the pain that the Jewish people suffered, not only there but throughout their history. The other thing is is this beautiful scene in, in the... Uh, Lord of the Rings, when they're in the tunnel and Gandalf's leading them through the darkness and they go across this bridge and this, this demon creature comes up with fire and is lapping at them and, and they, the bridge is falling in and Gandalf walks out and he slams the staff onto the ground and he says, you shall not pass. And everything shakes, you know, and the demon goes back down. And, and I, when I saw that, I thought, what God has done is he has the stake in the ground is the death of Jesus. And he's saying, here on this side is the human freedom. In your darkness, you can do this and this and this. And you can do this to my creation. And you can do this to yourself and to other people. But I'm putting, I'm taking responsibility for your freedom. And I'm putting an end to the consequences of it. And at the end of this, we have resurrection. Where things are restored. And so we get back what was lost. You know, the years, the Lord restores the years that the locusts have eaten according to you know, Joel's prophecy. Mm-hmm. We get that back in the resurrection. So God has wonderfully taken responsibility for our free, given it to us, and taken responsibility for it at the same time. And in the midst of that, we have to live with the consequences of our own darkness and what we do to one another and to the creation. I mean, we've got environmental tragedies going on around us right now that are going to it creates a lot of trauma for a lot of people around the world. And again, what the Jews went through is unthinkable. What any person that's been murdered, the, the rippling in, in implication, the consequences of that for the family. Now, what God has said is, it's not enough just for me to punish the murderer. What I'm going to do, what I'm after, is to restore the life of the one who's murdered. 
and to restore the relationship between the murderer and the one who was murdered and bring both sides of the family back into oneness and right relationship. That's the vision of heaven and the kingdom of heaven. So what I'm saying is, is in the, through Jesus' death and resurrection, he's put an end to the implication, the eternal implications of the Holocaust and has restored that. How he works that out, I don't know. Yeah. But Forgiveness. A, a person who has experienced something like that finds it very difficult. How on earth can you forgive somebody who kills your, your child? Right. And yet, in Christ, we're talking about God himself taking on himself the consequences, the pain, the suffering of that, handing back life and restoration in such a way that forgiveness really does become possible. And he shares his forgiving heart with us, just like he shares his love with us. I mean, that's the only possibility of forgiving someone who's grieved, who's, who's created such a grievous problem for us in our lives and our families, is it is that the love and forgiveness of the Father is given to us by Jesus, and we can choose to participate in that or participate in the darkness over here, which is to retaliate and to demand retribution, whatever. That's the spiral of human history. What about the people who can't forgive God? You know, not just the murderer. I was thinking about that, too. When you were talking about the people who have had things happen to them, I like the line from the whatever movie I saw, and it says, you know, Jesus might forgive you, but I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to forgive you. Right. There yeah, are people exactly. who carry that kind of anger around in them. They're not, we're not required. So bad. Yeah. We're really yeah. not required yeah. to do that. That kind of anger, of course, you know, crucifies us on the inside. They will mm-hmm. take you to your grave. Mm-hmm. But we're really not, I don't think we're required to do that. Not until you're good and ready to do it. Required I think a lot of people that, keep, keep a lot of guilt on themselves over stuff like that. Oh, and yeah, the, and the beauty forget. is that, uh, again, oh. as with our yeah. faith, as with everything else, that forgiveness already exists in Christ. Oh, absolutely. We simply have not got to the place where we can see that and receive it for what it is and receive the healing yeah. that will come from it. Uh, Robert Capon talks about it in his books. Uh, he has one story in one of his books about uh, it's kind of a gangster scene where uh, there's a hit man and, and one of the gangsters is, is you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, snuffed or uh, uh, mm. what do they call it? Rubbed out. Rubbed out. There's the word. Snuff is. Uh, That's good. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and and he shows how in Christ, in the end, the, one, the snuffer and the snuffy <laughs> are able to sit down together in the kingdom and have a drink together and... Be restored in relationship in spite of everything that took place between them. Mm-hmm. Beautiful picture. Very difficult, of course, and if not impossible, for us to enter into immediately. But through the death and resurrection of Christ, which we all have to experience eventually, mm-hmm. we're all going to die. And there's only one way to die. And there's only one kind of death that exists, and that is the death of Christ in only one thing comes of that death is the resurrection of Christ, mm-hmm. into which we have no choice but to enter, mm-hmm. whether we're going to receive it like the dwarves mm-hmm. in Narnia, or whether we're going to receive it like the uh, uh, like the, the, the children. When John was talking earlier about the, the perichoretic relationship that exists in the Trinity, mutual indwelling functioning is one. And that is different than what we experience. I totally agree. I, I still have to think that that's, that's definitely going on and it is shared with us. We just can't see it. Mm. We well, do it, not have, it's the yes, pair of glasses, <laughs> it's the understanding, it's the fallen mind, it's whatever you want to call it besides sinful human nature because I hate those term, that terminology, but I, I do know that that, 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 that perichoretic thing is, is going on with us. Jesus is in us. He lives in us. We mutually indwell in Him. The glory of it is, is is that we see it, we get a glimpse of it on this side, but we'll see it in totality on the other side. You forever, as a child of God, is bound up with His eternity. That's true. And yeah, inescapably so. That's the way He can't made get it. away from it. No, <laughs> heaven, hell, that's Sheol, the way He made it. Purgatory. Well, that's you what could, I gonna is. escape. You could have perished. I mean, you could be nothing, non-being. But He, he said no. But th- he said no. That's the ex Emilio uh, yeah. that he was writing about, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> there's a, there's no, a, no, no, hey, Mike, I, I've 
many, many testimonies, I think three or four I've seen myself, where people have come out of the Holocaust. I think Corey Ten Boom yeah. gave a, a but I've <laughs> seen a, I've seen Jews who have met their keepers, yeah. their yeah. prison guards. And they have had to, just because of, of this, they can't live with this anger. Yeah. And have found forgiveness. How do they find that kind of and forgiveness? And Jesus. Yes. And Jesus himself. And whether, whether they know it or not. The only place <laughs> there is redemption. Yeah, they they yeah, reject the name Jesus, the but one that's read. the real yeah. source. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus is not, really not into getting credit, you know. <laughs> he's really not worried about his, you know, he's more worried about his living life. I read a book. I don't even remember the name of the book or whether it was a, a fiction or whether or what it was. But at the end of the book, you know, you typically read the end. And it said, this one said, the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what we're trying to say is that the gospel tells us, even to ourselves personally, regardless of how we well, how well we know ourselves and how, how we know ourselves and our sins and our sinfulness, is which way we know ourselves best, we have not come to the last page of our story yet, for mm -hmm. one thing, in terms of all of our history of our pain and our, our suffering and our experiences that that bind us and, and, and tear us down. And we haven't come to the end of the story where we see ourselves as we were created and as we really exist in Christ as good and beautiful and part of the perfect creation. Mm -hmm. When we come to that end, a last page, and we see ourselves that way, we've really come to the beginning. Mm. That's till we have faces. That, mm. if I, uh, yes, okay. Uh, you're you're going to have C.S. Lewis. Book. You're going to have a face at last, not a mask. Well, I don't, or at least you're not, <laughs> you're not going to be it's looking at book the beginning. You're not going to be looking in a smoky mirror anyway. <laughs> you know, you're going to know what you're known. Yeah. It, it begs one more question, since we're about to run out of time. And that is, speak for this last few minutes to some eschatology here. You've got the popularity of books like Left Behind and people looking for a second return of Jesus. And uh, speak, speak to this culmination of all reconciliation. Well, I think the first thing, I would, my golden rule on eschatology is whatever we say about last, the last things, we must not assume the absence of Jesus Christ today. We talk about a second coming. We cannot assume that that means he's not here now. Mm -hmm. He is here now. He said, I'm not going to leave you orphaned. I'm going to come. Mm -hmm. You're going to discover I'm in my Father, you're in me, and I'm in you, as what's real. So to me, eschatology is largely uh, about repentance and the conversion of our minds. It's about the restoration of proper seeing and sight. Jesus is not absent. The life of the Father, Son, and Spirit is not absent. The kingdom of heaven is not absent. But we're like the dwarves in Narnia. We're sitting in our own worlds and our own illusions, and we're oblivious to what's really happening. And so the Spirit, eschatology, is the, is, is the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth coming of Jesus to reveal himself to us in our darkness. And it's we who are in the dark, as Jesus says, and we're the ones that are getting light. And that's the process that involves history and space and time just like it takes a time for a person to go from being a baby through those those hard years of adolescence, and then they hit, you know, they're they're uh, close to adult teen years where they know everything about everything, and everybody around them is is really, you know, stupid. And then they begin to learn. Wait a minute, I don't know so much. And then they begin to learn some things for real. In that process, it takes time. You just you can't have forty two years of experience given to you by reading one book. So that history is the time and space given to the human race by the Father, Son, and Spirit to get to grips, to live out their own theories on who we think God is and the way we think this works, to kill ourselves, to maim and destroy so much. It's the space and time God has given to us for, to do that so that we can come under the tutelage of the Spirit to see who we really are in the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit and choose personally and willfully to participate in that with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength because we've experienced evil. We've experienced the chaos. We've experienced the darkness, and we don't want it. We don't want any more to do with it. Now, that's almost inconceivable to think that that, that is, is, but that's what human history is about, is the education of the human race. Thank you so much for being with us again, Dr. Kruger, and thanks, Steve. Thanks to everyone on the panel. I'm Mike Fazelf. 
Let me conclude by saying that Dr. Baxter Kruger's book, The Great Dance, is available at the Perichoresis website at www.perichoresis.org. That's P-E-R-I-C-H-O-R-E-S-I-S, perichoresis.org. Thanks again for being with us. I'm Mike Fazell. You've been listening to You're Included. Be sure to check for future programs in this series on the Worldwide Church of God website, www.wcg.org. If you've enjoyed this program with Dr. Kruger, you might also enjoy the column he writes in Christian Odyssey, a free magazine that helps make sense of the modern Christian life. To order your free subscription to Christian Odyssey, visit www.christianodyssey.org. That's www.christianodyssey.org. Your Included is devoted to the good news that your Heavenly Father loves you, wants you, and includes you in Jesus Christ. Your Included is produced by the Worldwide Church of God.